And now may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be pleasing to you, O Lord. You are our rock and our redeemer. And we ask that in Jesus' name, amen. The last time I spoke on this sermon series about the Holy Spirit that we're calling Knowing the Unknown God, I offered five words from Jesus that if any Christian will use them, it will completely transform their Christian experience. That by using these five words, they'll go from being a good Christian to being a good Christian who is also spirit-filled. And those five words, again, were to those who ask him. We looked at Luke 11, who Jesus tells us about a father who loves to give his children good gifts. But of all those good gifts that God wants to give us, which are almost infinite in number, there is a gift at the top of the list, the best gift that he can give to a mortal human being. And that is the gift of being filled with the Holy Spirit. And that's exactly what the Father's waiting to do, wanting to do, and ready to do. But it only comes to those who ask him. Now, in today's message, I want to really build on the message that Pastor Ron preached last Sunday. Time out. Time out. How fun is that? I mean, yeah. I mean, when Brother Ron gave us a powerful message last Sunday. It was good. But about 11.30 uh, yesterday morning right here, Brother Ron became Pastor Ron, and that is just absolutely fantastic. So I want to build on the excellent sermon of the excellent man who is Pastor Ron. And last week, he told us that just like individual Christians are given a choice. God doesn't force anything on people, never. So each individual Christian has a choice, they can say, more, Father, more of the Holy Spirit, or the individual Christians say, not so much. And he taught us that in the same way, any congregation, any gathered group of Christian people can say to the Father, more of the Holy Spirit moving among us, or they can say, yeah, not so much. And he did that in such an excellent way. And I want to take it a little bit deeper today in what I have to share with you, starting with this question. What does the New Testament reveal about the level of activity of the Holy Spirit that we, could, we can and should expect in our gatherings? I mean, when we're together for worship, for sure, but also for fellowship, when we're together in our small groups, when we're together in our mission teams, when we're together in our business meetings, whenever we are together as Christ's body, what is normal? What should we expect the Holy Spirit to do? What gifts and manifestations should we expect to see and experience? How much of the Holy Spirit is normal to experience in any Christian church? Well, with that question, we, we want to turn to the Bible, because if you are watching Good Shepherd for the first time, welcome. If you're here for the first time or you've come back a second time, this gives me an awesome opportunity to let you know that here at Good Shepherd, the Bible defines what's normal for us, what's normal to believe, what's normal to do, what's normal to think, what's normal in our relationships, all of that normal is defined for us by the Bible. So that's certainly going to be true today as we ask the question, what is a normal church like? How does it operate when it comes to the Holy Spirit as is taught in the Bible? So today we're going to take it to 1 Corinthians chapter 14, that's verses 26 through uh, 33 and page 1141. And as always, as we get ready to learn, first some background. This congregation, the one in the ancient city of Corinth, was started by the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul went to a lot of places, and he started a number of congregations. Corinth happens to be one of those that he directly planted himself. 
He was used by God to bring it into existence. So when he's away from them, which he often was, he kept in contact with them by writing them letters. And this book in the Bible is one of those letters that he wrote. Now let's talk a little bit more about Corinth. Interesting place. Corinth uh, was a colorful city back in the ancient day. You could go to Corinth for a good time, any kind of good time that you want to have, especially the kind that you don't want anybody back home knowing that you had. Corinth was a little bit like Vegas. Well, actually a lot like Vegas. What was done in Corinth stayed in Corinth. And interestingly, especially today, is that Corinth was also a destination because it uh, held lots of sports activities. The Isthmus Games were there on a regular basis, so you could go for a, a good time and a great sporting event, and what, uh, yeah, that's right, the Super Bowl is in Las Vegas. So in so many weird, amazing ways, Corinth, Vegas, 2,000 years separated, virtually the same, culturally and entertainment and uh, carrying on. And of all the congregations that Paul planted, I think it's very fair to say that Corinth was his wild child, all right? I mean, the one that tended to misbehave spectacularly when it was kind of in that mood. So I'm always drawn drawn to Corinth being the wild child of my family. I, I feel an affinity for these crazy folks there in Corinth. And for all the fact that they lived in this lascivious city and that they themselves had a tendency to just take it over the top, the Holy Spirit was moving powerfully, blazing. All the people that attended the Corinthian church seem to be filled with the Holy Spirit, and I mean on fire with the Holy Spirit. They were crazy in love with Jesus and just incredibly filled with the Holy Spirit. The thing was that when they came together, as these kinds of people, cumulatively, the Holy Spirit was just like blazing out of control. In fact, Paul was concerned that they were bringing so much of the manifestation of the Holy Spirit into their gatherings that he was worried that the important stuff would get lost in the crazy, okay? That the important stuff would be overshadowed by the just amazing, crazy stuff that the Holy Spirit was doing. So he actually gave them guidelines, and we'll look at them in a second. He gave them guidelines on how to conduct their worship services so that the activity of the Holy Spirit could be fully manifested, but that there would also be good order so that people could be encouraged and built up. But that was the normal Sunday uh, at, the, at the church of Corinth. The Holy Spirit was just at work everywhere in everybody doing everything. And that was the situation that Paul had to deal with. That was normal. <laughs> I mean, imagine that. I mean, imagine that. I, I want to talk to all my fellow pastors here for, for a minute. Imagine that on Monday morning or Monday afternoon when we meet and we go over the worship service where you have to say, dang, it got out of control again. What are we going to do, Sandy? I mean, I was awesome. The Lord's presence was powerful. People were really moving the spirit, but I think we let him just get too crazy there and maybe we missed a few important things. But, but we'll, we'll, we'll figure it out. I'd be a nice meeting to have every Monday afternoon. <laughs> That's how it was at Corinth. And that is why Paul wrote them these words. What then, brothers and sisters, when you come together, each one has a hymn, a lesson, a revelation, a tongue or an interpretation. Let all things be done for building up. If anybody speak in a tongue, let there be only two or at the most three, and each in turn, and let someone interpret. But if there's no one to interpret, let each of them keep silent in church and speak to himself and to God. Let two or three prophets speak, and let others weigh what is said. If a revelation is made to another sitting there, let the first be silent. For you can all prophesy, but one by one, please." 
so that all may learn and all be encouraged. And remember, the spirits of the prophets are subject to the prophets. For God is not a God of confusion, but a God of peace. Now, if I was going to give a little title to this uh, teaching, I might call it the anatomy of a spirit-filled church or what a normal church looks like and does. So let's get into it now more particularly. What makes a Christian congregation a spirit-filled Christian congregation? Lots of, Christ- lots of congregations, some are spirit-filled. What's the difference? Well, let's be very precise here so we have a keen biblical uh, understanding and grounding. It has to be in the Bible. Now, we've learned already the five words that cause a good Christian to become a good spirit-filled Christian to those who ask him. That Christian who says, Father, fill me with the Holy Spirit, and now today more, and in this circumstance even more, and as I come to church, Lord, more. That is a spirit-filled Christian. Big, big, big difference. They've used the five words. But what about the congregation? What's the key, biblically, to having a congregation be a spirit-filled congregation? In this case, it's two words, not five. That's for the individual. Two Two words for the congregation that is spirit-filled. That's words in verse 26, and they are the words, each one. A congregation is spirit-filled because each one of the individuals who gathers in that congregation is spirit-filled. What is the church? Not a building, not a program. The church is people. What are the building blocks of a Christian congregation? It's people. What makes a congregation a spirit-filled congregation? Each one of the people in that congregation is in their own way pursuing a life of being filled with the Holy Spirit. Makes just complete sense, perfect sense. So that's what makes a congregation spirit-filled. It contains spirit-filled people. And then what is it like? So what's it like to be in such a place with such people gathered for your regular worship service? Well, Paul tells us. He gives us a, a list of examples. It is not an exhaustive list. It's a sample. Here's a sample of some of the ways that people operate in the Holy Spirit when they are in a spirit-filled congregation. And it's all based on each one. You, 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 even me. Each one. Each one has a hymn. Each one has a lesson. Each one has a revelation. And each one has a tongue and or an interpretation. Let's go to the top of the list. Each one has a him. Now, what does that mean? I believe it can mean several things, but I know that, that basically it means that in a spirit-filled congregation, each person who comes has a passion for the presence of God. The thing that instantly happens to a person when they get filled with the Spirit is they begin to have a passion for the presence of God. They want to be with God. They want to be with God more. They want to be with God closer. They want to be with God longer. They want to feel God's presence all around them. You just begin to be very addicted on being in the presence of God. And above all, they want to worship. And when people like that in their own way, it's very particular to each one of us, but we all share the commonality of desiring to be in the presence of God. When you gather together people who have that passionate desire to feel God in their presence as they worship God, you are going to be in an experience like no other in in, in life. Heaven starts to come down as passion for God's praise goes up. And that interplay of our praise and passion with the Spirit's manifesting gives you an environment that you cannot reproduce anywhere on earth. It's only in heaven. And there's no place you would rather be. It's the highlight of your week, and it's something that sustains your life. And each one of us 
brings our passion for being in God's presence. And when that passion comes together, it intensifies and multiplies and creates that moment where heaven comes down a little bit closer to earth. And you get that foretaste of how glorious it's going to be when everything is only the presence of God. And then forever. We each have a part of bringing that reality to our church. That's what it says. Each one has a a hymn. Next one is, each one has a lesson. I love this one, and I'm just going to say very honestly, and I'm glad you're listening online today, but this is a way that the Holy Spirit is working very powerfully at Good Shepherd. Each one has a lesson, which simply means that when we're together, Hopefully we're preaching the gospel, and hopefully we are basing things on a scripture. We read scripture, you know, that we're bringing the Bible into every conversation that we have. And so it means that each one has a teaching, which is is this. We're hearing the same Bible verses, but we're all getting very unique messages. Let me say that again. We're hearing the same Bible verses. But by the Holy Spirit, we're all hearing different messages. This is the glory of our small group. This is the glory of frogs on Friday. We sit before a scripture, okay? And the scripture is read, and it's read by everybody, and there's a time of prayer and pondering, and it says, so what do you hear the Lord speaking to you through this scripture? And the person on your right says, you know, when I read this scripture, I really hear God saying, and you're sitting next to them, and you're looking at them and saying, what? Because you're thinking to yourself, that's not what's saying to me. It's fascinating, though. That is so interesting. That is so stirring. You say, well, what do you hear God saying? Well, I, for me, this, this verse, you know, says this into my life. And the other people go, whoa, I, I, had, I, I never thought of that for a second. And then the person says, yeah, that's interesting because I didn't have either one of those. When the, I hear this scripture, I hear the Lord speaking this, and you, you immediately know you are experiencing a miracle. How is this possible? It's the same Bible verse. They're English words. You can just read them. But they're not just English words. They're divine words. Holy Spirit-inspired words. And when a Holy Spirit-filled person intersects with a Holy Spirit-inspired scripture, the, the, the Holy Spirit's going to say all kinds of things differently to probably each one of us so that when you put it all together, we are hearing this, this antiphon of revelation on Scripture and so many levels. It's so fun. You just do that all the time. You know what I'm talking about. But it also happens when we're together as a congregation because when I preach, and I'm teaching now on Thursdays too, I get emails Wonderful emails. I get emails all the time that says, you know, on Sunday, thanks for the sermon, and when you were talking about what Jesus meant when he said, deny yourself and follow me. You know, as I listened to that, it was really good. But I started thinking about this, and they just type in all these things that the Holy Spirit revealed to them in the scripture that I was teaching on. And when I look at their revelation, I think to myself, dang, I should have preached that sermon. Mine was garbage. That's really good. It's so fun. So I'm sharing with you teaching that the the Holy Spirit has revealed to me, but you in dialogue with me and the Holy Spirit often give me feedback, and I grow, and I increase, and that's what happens every time when spirit-filled people get together together under the teaching of the Bible, under the teaching spirit of the Holy Spirit. So fun. This is also fun. Each one has a hymn. Each one has a teaching. Each one has a revelation. Man. Okay. So what is revelation? I believe it's very simple. Holy Spirit revelation is heavenly intel. You get a piece of information directly from the Holy Spirit. No one else gets it. You get it. It's a piece of heavenly intel. Here's how it goes. Uh, You've already gathered, so I don't know how much time. You probably had to scoot in here because it's raining. Uh, But maybe after the service, you'll just touch base with your friends and see how the week is going. And in that conversation happens all the time. Somebody goes like this and goes, you know, I I I was thinking of you this week. 
Really? Yeah. And, you know, since I'm thinking about you, I decided, you know, I'm going to start praying for you. And so I just prayed for you this week. I mean, that's very common. I prayed for you this week. And then they go on. And, you know, it's funny. As I was praying for you this week, I got this picture in my mind. I, I saw you. It was, it was you. I know. I, was, I know. And you were like sitting in a rocking chair, rocking back and forth. I could just see it so clearly. But you looked anxious. You looked troubled. You were in this rocking chair, but you were, looked really troubled. And then it's like kind of out of nowhere, this, this quilt just sort of descended down from the sky. And it came around you, and it enclosed you, and it wrapped itself around you. And I said, Holy Spirit, is there like a message here with the quilt? And the Holy Spirit said, yes. That quilt represents the extra grace that your friend is asking for. Because they're going through something very hard, but they haven't told anybody yet. I mean, it's private. They haven't told anybody yet. But they've been asking for extra grace. And that's what the quilt reveals. Tell them that I have heard them and that extra grace is now theirs. And you tell that to your friend, who then does what? Of course, you've seen it a million times. They burst into tears. <laughs> Because they feel so loved. They know God loves them. They trust that God loves them. But sometimes it's so tough that you just got to feel God loving on you. And they get a message directly from God through you because you had a revelation that God hears their prayers, cares for them, and is going to be there and get them through it. Oh, my gosh. It's so amazing and so miraculous, and it is also normal. It's just another Sunday at good old Good Shepherd Church. Biblically, that's normal. I'll, I'll end with the last one, and each one has a tongue and an interpretation. And let me tell you, it's an interesting phenomenon. I've seen it plenty of times. Uh, the Holy Spirit wants to give a direct message to the whole church, and wants to do it in a specific way, so chooses someone and says, you're going to deliver a message now, but I want you to deliver it in a language that's not English. So the Holy Spirit gives them that language. They speak it out, have no idea what they just said. That's fun. Let's take it from me. That's, you're going to feel really awkward, believe me. You're like, <laughs> oh, boy. And it's okay, but somebody else has gotten an interpretation of that, and they, they say, okay, here's what the Lord is doing, and this is the Lord was saying, and they deliver the message. And, uh, and that's what that. But it's grounded in an even bigger reality. And the bigger reality is this. In a spirit-filled congregation, each person just comes to the gathering. And next week, beforehand or after, we'll talk about the Super Bowl and stuff like that. We're just normal people. We're just spirit-filled Christians being together, and we walk into the space, and we start worshiping, and, but each one of us came willing. Listen, in a spirit-filled congregation, each person comes willing, willing to be used by the Holy Spirit any way the Spirit wants to use us. You, 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 definitely you, even me. And that kind of environment where the Holy Spirit is welcome and where all the people are saying, any way you want, if you've got any use for me this Sunday, I'm available and I'm listening. And then you press on with the service before you. That is what is normal. Listen, for most of us, we didn't grow up in that kind of church environment. I, I did not. I, I didn't start living in that kind of a church environment until I was an adult. And there's no need to criticize any of our church backgrounds. I'm thankful for each one. Any place where it's all about Jesus, it was good, and we got a lot of good out of it. There's no agenda here other than normal. Just want to be a spirit-filled Christian the way that I'm meant to be. We just want to be a spirit-filled congregation the way that we are meant to be. Let me close with this. Yesterday, right there, Ron Barrow closed the circle on a very long journey and fully submitted himself 
and then was confirmed into his life calling and became an ordained pastor. Very dramatic, very unforgettable. For most of us, our ordination into ministry is not that particular or not that dramatic. But for all of us, we have a calling. We have a gifting. We have a way we're meant to live out that calling and use that gifting. Home base for all that is your congregation, which helps you to realize that you're in this congregation because you were called to this congregation. I came from Minnesota because I'm called to this congregation. No one is here by accident. We are called to this congregation because something that the Holy Spirit has given you is absolutely essential to being everything that this place is meant to be. And when you begin to experience that empowerment, what's in you and we see so beautifully in you starts coming out even more. And then all that the Holy Spirit wants to do starts to become a reality more and more. That's our normal Christian experience in our normal church life. Let's stand up and just give thanks to God for giving us this amazing good life. Father, in the name of Jesus, we ask for a really good gift. In fact, anything and everything Father, you want to give us, give us. And Father, together we would love to be a church filled and operating in the Holy Spirit. And we'd like each one of us to feel called to this place, important to this place, important to each other, and a part of something so much bigger than what we could be by ourselves. So thank you for this uplifting sense of encouragement that we are going through in these days. Lord, as you bless us, let us be a blessing. And that is our prayer today. In Jesus' name and all God's people said, amen. Amen.